Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so excited for the next panel we have. We have four amazing and accomplished women, all working in conservation, all from the Global South. They have similar perspectives and similar experiences, yet they each work in very diverse communities. So I can't wait to bring them out. But before I do that, I want to recognize someone very special to the Explorer community. Can we please recognize Lida Hill as a group? One year ago today on this stage, Lida made a commitment. She made a commitment to women explorers at National Geographic. She dedicated a million dollars to support women, to support them for things like training, professional development, and dependent care. These funds have gone to almost 115 explorers and have truly changed how they're able to do their work. They can network at conferences, they can get into the field longer without worrying about their dependents. So thank you, Lida. And now to our panelists. Liliana Gutierrez is a marine conservationist and a Nat Geo explorer based in Mexico. Rebecca Cochulim is from the Borrego County Conservancies. She's their director for the Northern Rangelands Trust in Kenya. Intan Suchi Nurharti is a paleoclimate scientist, an oceanographer, and a Nat Geo explorer based in Indonesia. She's a recipient of one of Lida's grants. And Erika Cuellar is a wildlife conservationist and Nat Geo explorer based in Bolivia. Welcome. All right. I just gave the briefest description of who you are and where you're from. I'd like you each to add a sentence or two more about your work and how you're here. Thank you. Uh, well, my name is Liliana. I'm from Mexico City, but I live now in the best place in the world, in La Paz, Baja California Sur. And I work in coastal communities with fisher villages, in, in fishing villages, and we work in both sides of the story to restore fisheries in the ocean with the technical and the science aspect of it, but what I consider most important, working also on land in the community with the fishermen and with their families, with the women, with the children, and trying to restore both the communities and the fisheries. Rebecca? Thank you. I'm Rebecca from Northern Kenya, uh, a former conservancy manager uh, with an experience of nine years working with communities. Uh, Northern Rangelands Trust is a movement uh, by communities to conserve the environment and to look at solutions uh, into the issues that are affecting communities in northern Kenya. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Intan. I'm a paleoclimate ocean scientist from the Indonesian Institute of Sciences. So what that means is I'm one-third climate scientist, I'm one-third oceanographer, and one-third scuba divers. Um, but in seriousness, what I do is to provide climate data to the community at times and place where there is no observations, and I ask nature unlocking information from corals as the history book of our ocean. Hello, uh, my name is Erika Cuellar. I am from Bolivia. I am a scientist who believes in the power of the people to change directions in conservation. So for me, people are uh, crucial in, the, in our fight for conservation, and this is what I am uh, working on, uh, involving local people, indigenous people, in the long-term uh, conservation process in Latin America, and now I'm moving to the Arabian Peninsula. So let's continue that thread of, of community. I want to, we have some images from each one of you of how you, that show how you work with communities. Yeah. Liliana, you want to talk about your particular Mexican Fisher community? Yes. Uh, actually, when, when I think in, on, on this question, it reminded me um, the reflection that Brent invited us all to, to do yesterday when he said, 
when he said it is important how we talk to each other, how we create these abundant spaces in which we can involve and we can talk about the things that really matter. So for me, what is um, the biggest opportunity and the biggest challenge is how do we go from the shield of I know to the bridge of how can we learn together? Because there's nothing more inspiring than learning together. So in, dealing, in, in, in making connections, in working relationships, the ability to really deep listening, it's for me the biggest opportunity to exercise our empathy to yes, fix problems, but most importantly, to design futures together. Rebecca? Um, in Kenya, conservation in the past was about government. It was about a few people who uh, really saw the benefits. But for me, working with community is about building relationships and making sure that our biggest issue was about uh, insecurity in the region. And you know, when you don't have uh, security and your people are not feeling safe, also the environment and the biodiversity is not safe. So for me, it's about looking at how can we make uh, the people safe, and therefore, how can we also now involve the communities to see the importance of wildlife and biodiversity? So, working with communities, uh, it was something that uh, for myself when I finished the university, I was like not uh, prepared. But when I saw the kind of uh, problems that we were facing in the in the community, it propelled me to see that um, we need to provide that platform. We need to have these communities to see that protecting the biodiversity is also an alternative source of livelihoods. So it makes a whole of, lot of difference when the communities own the process and they participate and they provide solutions to the issues that are affecting them. Yeah, for, for me, I started as a heart scientist, I guess. Uh, I studied the issue of ocean acidification that's happening globally, what, but we didn't have any data about what's happening in Indonesia in our backyard. And our backyard is just not any other backyard, it's coral triangle. Uh, we know that ocean acidification will influence coral reef and many other marine organisms that are made of shells, like coral oysters and lobsters, those are expensive stuff. So for us, it's just not about ecology. This is a story of economy. So when I put my monitoring station for ocean acidification, I put it next to pearl farms so that my data can be useful to them as well. Um, but little did I know as I entered this, this community was that we have a common ground uh, where I came from the ecology into economy. They are coming from economy to ecology because pearl farm areas are actually arguably one of the best coral reef protection in Indonesia. They have to protect a wide area so that the bomber, the cyanide uh, poison will not get into their area. And this is uh, one of the best protected I've ever seen. So that's how, where we came from. And we uh, come together that this data will be useful for me as well as for their community. Uh, for me, working with the communities is the, is the only way to do it in countries like mine, where you have 70% of indigenous people. and where the law allow uh, indigenous people to survive on wildlife. So you have these uh, biodiverse rich areas, and it's not only in Bolivia, but you, it's uh, in Latin America. And you have this, um, uh, you have this mix of rich, uh, bio, bio, biodiverse rich areas and local people living uh, next or inside uh, important areas. So, how are you going to do conservation if you don't involve local people? For me, um, I, I always think in this phrase, uh, Eduardo Galeano said in Spanish, in, in English, it's kind of like, uh, conservation without people is gardening. In Spanish, sounds better. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, uh, conservation sin la gente, jardinería. And so, yeah. um, so for me, it's impossible not to involve indigenous people. And also because of the knowledge they have. So my, my job, my work, my entire um, time, it's to complement, try to co learn how to complement their traditional knowledge in order for them to be recognized. Um, so, and, and also we, we, we talk about, um, um, 
when brains go away from the from from the countries, and we are, we are we are losing those knowledge from those people because they are migrating, they don't have opportunities in their own places. So for me, uh, as a scientist, as a conservationist, I cannot see uh, myself working, dedicating my life to conservation without involving indigenous people in the long-term process. Right. So. I don't think it's a secret to anyone here that you have an all-woman panel sitting here. <laughs> and um, in fact, it's the title of the panel. So <laughs> let's, let's address that. Um, I, I want to hear some, some specific stories after meeting each one of you. I was struck by, Rebecca, your story of you truly are a groundbreaker, the first female director in Northern Rain Rounds Trust. Um, how, did you, how did you start that? How did you gain the trust of the communities? What was your breakthrough moment? Uh, actually, uh, starting as a conservancy manager, uh, back then when uh, the country um, was pretty, pretty new about the conservation model as driven by the community, nine years ago, it was pretty hard because Back then, we didn't have policies, we didn't have legislations that support the community to protect wildlife, let alone the issues that were affecting the community. For example, the insecurity. We, for example, we treasure livestock. We treasure uh, cattle. It's the medium of exchange. So um, it was really heartbreaking to see that um, these are the issues that also are now driving the conflict around that area. It was about pasture, it's about grazing, and all this because of the overgrazing and the overstocking, the animals uh, were not getting enough pasture. So it was about building the relationships with the community, earning their trust, and being a woman, it's very hard because uh, for us, a woman is um, a second class. You, you, you're not like hard, and then you're young. So it was about like listening, um, providing that um, listening ear, for example, to the elders, and be able to accommodate their criticism at, at a times, and uh, be able to let them understand what are the benefits. If you conserve, for example, uh, a giraffe, for, for in our case where I used to work, uh, they saw tourism coming in, they saw the, the attachment but when the kids go and see this wildlife for the first time, because the wildlife were like poached because of the people using it for food. So when they saw the wildlife coming in and um, people coming to see it, and the children going to see them, it, it brought a sense of attachment and a, ses a sense of uh, this is what we lost. And it's, it's coming back. This is the only chance that we have to protect our wildlife. So, during that nine year period, it made me to understand that you need to reach out to these communities. You need to make them understand why they need to protect the, the biodiversity. So uh, coming into the position of being a director, it's uh, like now scaling up and uh, making sure that we make our communities understand uh, why we need to protect this wildlife and why we need to protect our bi bi biodiversity. It's beautiful. Yeah. So why are the giraffes in a boat? That's just what we all want to know. Come on, come on, why are the giraffes in a boat? <laughs> Ooh. Short, short version? <laughs> yes, these were the translocation we did in 2011. Having uh, tried to convince the community and be able to understand uh, the need to protect the biodiversity. These giraffe are the Rothschild giraffe, endangered species. And uh, several decades from the stories I had, they were roaming in that landscape. And because of poaching and the population pressure, uh, they, were, they disappeared from that landscape. And so from the, uh, building that foundation, dialogue, and making this community understand the need to protect the, the, the species, they, they accepted and requested government to bring back the species. So actually, we, the, the community went to the government, the KWS, and ask for the translocation of these species back to the environment. And currently now, that was a holding space they put the wildlife. So they, they've now, last year, during the, um, the, the uh, participation, like the local participation from the community, they set aside land, a big land, 
to make sure that now these species can now rewild and come back to the community. Wonderful. Yeah. So, so it's a process of making sure that you build that trust, you earn that trust so that they can accept to have the word life. Yeah. Intan, you, you mentioned this briefly that your early work and, and most of your work focused on filling in data gaps, right? Data that just didn't exist. But the thing that I most love about what you told me is that you've now shifted your focus. You're still doing that, but you've shifted your focus to storytelling. And, and, and explaining why it matters. What, what, what was that moment? What made you change? Yeah. So the first mission from Nat Geo was um, to establish the first ocean acidification monitoring, hard data science. Um, and then Lida, Lida Hill have this generous program of uh, support for women and dependent care. And that encouraged me to go further, something not business as usual, normal science that I do. So what I want to do with this is something different. So let's transform scientific knowledge into the hands of policymakers. So right now I'm basically transforming it into a policy brief, uh, talking with people on local level, but also going up to the national levels. Because ocean acidification is a hard issue to remember. It's, it's an on, slow onset changes. So unless someone keep reminding and putting it in policy, I think it will be easily forgotten. Great. And Liliana. Turning to you, you started working with men, correct? How many years did you do that <laughs> before, you, before eventually you were able to pull the women in? I'm 42, so probably I've been doing this for 22 years now, and it wasn't until seven years ago, six years ago, that I began working with more intensively with women. And, and why, why the shift, and yeah, why so recently? Yeah. Well. Um, I work, when, when I began working um, together with my organization, uh, first thing I knew when I, when I told my husband when we were going to be working was, he asked me, why are you going to work in one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in La Paz if you just arrived and you don't know anything about the place? And do you know that all the illegal fishermen live there? So I was like, okay, it sounds like a very exciting work. And <laughs> We learned a lot. We, we created those, uh, we were so great, we were so fortunate to be able to create together with the community those spaces where we could discuss the things that really matter in a very human way. Um, they uh, self-imposed a ban for six years and they recovered the fishery. They've been fishing again the pensions for two years now. And when the banks began to grow, of course, a lot of poaching began to happen uh, again. And for men, it was kind of difficult to stop that because they had been illegal fishermen themselves. So they were like, why are we gonna do this? If we know we need to protect these, but at the same time, there was a conflict inside them. For women, it was amazing. First of all, the courage they would go and say, this is the, the results of our effort. We need to stand for this. We need to defend the bank we've been taking care of. And second, we're, gonna do, we're not gonna do this because we're against the other fishermen. Actually, we should, go to their, we should go to those villages and help them to do the same with their resources. But we're gonna do this. So that was the shift. When I saw the huge potential for teamwork, courage, creativity, intensity, and, 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 and this, this, this courage to do what you need to do every day. They began the first anti-poaching unit made only by female in, 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 in Mexico to defend the fishery. And in two months, and this is all recorded. I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm not overreacting to the emotion I feel yeah. for being in, the, in this panel. This is recorded. In two months, they contain the illegal poaching of their shells. Not only that, now that they have recovered that place, they are thinking on designing a, a, a little protected area in which they can invite people of La Paz to enjoy the story that used to be a dangerous place for them. And now they're being trained to be bird watchers guides. Wow. So it, to them. 
So it went from an anti-poaching uh, unit of women to a true citizens engagement um, effort to recover our spaces. And let me tell you, in countries like Mexico, these little steps, these little examples are so important to transform our society. Wonderful. Erica, you're, you're a biologist and a conservationist, but you're a teacher, right? <laughs> you, you train, and, and similar to Liliana, you started training all men. Why, why all men? <laughs> I haven't had a choice. I mean, I was surrounded by hunters um, and also, but it wasn't a problem for me because I, I had a wonderful father and especially a wonderful mother who treat us, my brothers and myself, like we, we had to do the same thing. So I didn't have that problem. And, but I had to learn, I have to learn how to get into the society I was going to work with because uh, women have the right to, say, to tell men, they're men, you're not going to that, with that woman for hunting, you know? So, so I had to wait in the community for about two months and just um, let women know me uh, before they allow me to go with their men. For, uh, in the, during the hunting, and it is completely normal. I mean, if I was one of the wives, I, you know, it's it's normal, I guess. But um, um, for me, uh, curiosity and and uh, research it doesn't have gender. I mean, for, for me, um, I I I I expand uh, the the most uh, happy years in my life working with all. Uh, the hunters and in, in that area. So I, want, I always wanted to involve women. I failed because I wrote, uh, I don't know, hundreds of proposals. Uh, and, and I always wanted to involve women. But um, it's, it's the society I'm working with. So it's part of the, of, of, of the respect you, you bring to these communities to just um, um, act as they, um, even if I am not agree, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the way they, they do. But when you, when you work with them, you realize women have the power there. And, and also what, what uh, was very important for me was that the knowledge, is, is, it was very, very well um, established. Uh, I work with hunters, I, I hunt with them, I eat what they, they hunt uh, to learn. Uh, but but um, women knew about um, uh, reproduction, seasonality. Uh, they knew all about that. Why? Because hunters bring the, the animals to, to women, and they just prepare them. So they, they know everything. They know what size of the armadillos, when, when are, how many armadillos, which species. So the knowledge is amazing. It's, it's complementary, and, and, and I learned that. Uh, it was difficult, but uh, for me, as I said, I, science uh, doesn't have uh, frontiers or gender, so, um, you know, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a problem for me. It's not a, it's not a binary decision. No, yeah. I don't know, because I want them to see me as a professional biologist, as a scientist, and, and so I, you know, maybe maybe they see me differently, but I I just uh, try not to to get involved in that. Uh, we have too many uh, challenges and issues to deal with when we are trying to do conservation. So I forget I am a woman. <laughs> I'm just a scientist. <laughs> So we've got this uh, light blinking at us <laughs> because we're going to get kicked off stage in two minutes. So I want to ask you all the same question. I want you to try to answer in one to two words, right? And you don't know what's coming. <laughs> but there's so much um, discussion and, and worthy discussion around the difficulties of being the first woman in a field or the only woman in a field. But I also think you've all touched on the fact that it's a strength, yes. right? It gives you a, a different perspective, different skills, different access and trust in the community. So in one to two words, what would be an adjective you'd use or a word you'd use to describe what, what the strength, what the, 
the relative advantage it is of being a woman in your field. Anyone can go. And I know you're all working in your second language too, so I apologize. <laughs> I, I would say um, exercising empathy. Wonderful. And being that's open. That's way more than two. To change. <laughs> Exercising empathy, you would have just won, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I would say that you need to be patient and uh, have a listening ear. Patience and listening. Yeah. Wonderful. I would say keep going further and yes. further and further. So persistence. Yes. Uh, never be afraid. I mean, I, I'm always afraid when I start something, but, um, but just carry on. I mean, it. Yeah. Fearlessness, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I, di I, I didn't have the, the right word, but yeah. yeah. Wonderful. You well, look like that and, you know, carry on, even if you are trembling like I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies, you are inspirational, not because you're women, but because you're women and your work is phenomenal. And so it's been a, a pleasure to share the stage with you. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Bye. Thank you.